we'll take up an offering right after the service. And um, I feel like God wants me to just go ahead and preach. We're in Job chapter 13 tonight. Job chapter 13. This won't be the first time you've heard this verse, but this probably is the first time that I've preached a whole message on just this verse. I have alluded to it, I'm sure, many times down through the years because it's one of my favorite verses. It's a verse that God has spoke to my heart many times very strongly, used this verse in several deep, dark valleys, and if I get time, I may share a little bit about that, but more importantly is the truth that's found in this verse here tonight, Job chapter 13. If you're there, stand with me, please, out of respect for the Word of God. And I want to read the first 15 verses so we can kind of get the the heart and mind of Job. Uh, I think most of us in here are familiar with the life of Job, and I think most of us know that Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. Job lived, he was a contemporary probably uh, with Abraham, even though there's no mention of Abraham in this passage of Scripture. Most historians, Bible scholars believe the book of Job is one of the oldest stories in the Bible. And so... uh, This is all the way back at the beginning of the Old Testament as far as chronological history is concerned. And um, Job's been through some difficult days. He's lost everything he had pretty much. He's sitting in ashes right now with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He's got three friends sitting around him making accusations, trying very feebly, very weakly to try and encourage or figure out what the problem is or doing a very poor job of it as we're going to see in our text here tonight. Job chapter 13, verse number one. Job says, Lo, mine eye hath seen all this. Mine ear hath heard and understood it. What ye know, the same do I know also. I'm not inferior unto you. He's talking to these three friends. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God, but ye are forgers of lies. You're all physicians of no value. That's King James for just calling them a bunch of quacks. He says, Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. Hear now my reasoning, and hearken to the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak wickedly for God, and talk deceitfully for him? Will you accept his person? Will you contend for God? Is it good that he should search you out? Or as one mocketh another, do you... Uh, so mock him. He will surely reprove you if you do secretly accept persons. Shall not his excellency make you afraid and his dread fall upon you? Your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay. Hold your peace. Let me alone that I may speak and let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? Though he slay me, Yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. I want to preach on that phrase there in verse 15 tonight. I will maintain mine own ways. Lord, help us tonight, I pray. As we examine this verse, Lord, as we just dig in the riches of this statement, and Lord, the truths in this verse, may you help us tonight, I pray. You know what each and every one of us stand in need of far better than I do. Lord, I know I'm unworthy to stand here tonight and try to help this church. But Father, I pray that you would strengthen and undergird me. Help me preach with power. May the word of God go forth and may hearts be stirred and challenged and changed. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. When you read this verse, even just taking it and reading it by itself, still speaks volumes. Obviously, the context of this verse is Job has been surrounded by these friends. Job's questioning God. He's making some comments in chapter 3 and then in chapter 4. Eliphaz believes that those that are innocent do not suffer, which is absolutely not true. In fact, the Bible says, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, But yeah, it, it, they, they go back and forth, one, the other, Bildad ch- speaks in chapter number eight, and Job replies, and Zophar speaks in chapter number 11, and Job replies, and Job is still talking here. 
He's pretty much, and it's still early on in the book. This book goes on for another uh, quite a few chapters, but Job is about fed up with the nonsense that's coming from these so-called friends of his. They sat there for seven days and didn't say a word, and then when they did start talking, I imagine he wished they'd go back to just being quiet. And that's pretty much what he said in here. He said, uh, hold your peace and leave me alone. And uh, this, uh, just the, the, the logic that they had, the reasoning that they had was that nobody would be going through this kind of problems if they hadn't done something terribly wrong. And we know from the scriptures that that wasn't the case. And don't have time to lay the whole book out. I want to focus on verse 15 tonight. And I want to focus on that word maintain. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Now, I looked that word up tonight. I've got three simple points. We're going to look at the definition of maintain, the decision to maintain, and the determination to maintain. I want to just give you the three points up front, and then I want to jump right into this definition because I did two definitions. I looked it up in the English in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. If you don't have a Webster's 1828 Dictionary, you can either buy one or you can just go online. It's online. You can look up words, and it's amazing at how biblical and scriptural the definitions are in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. It's a phenomenal Bible study guide. I've used it online, but I also have a hardback copy in my office, and it's, it's got great faith. He uses Bible verses a lot of times when he's defining words, and so it's a good study guide. So I look it up in English, because that's what we're reading tonight is the English. I'm going to give you the English definition. Uh, and it's got multiple definitions, of which we're familiar, I'm sure, with most of them. And then we're going to look at the Hebrew definition of this word, maintain, to set the tone for the message tonight. Now, the word maintain in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary has seven or eight different uh, uses. Let me just give them to you quickly. Number one, it means to hold or to preserve or to keep in any particular state or condition, to support, to sustain, not to suffer, to fall, or to decline, as in, for example, maintaining a certain degree of heat in a furnace, or to maintain the fertility in soil, or to maintain one's present character or reputation. So that's one of the meanings of the word, to hold, to preserve, or to keep in a particular state or condition. Another use of the word maintain is to hold, to keep, not to lose, or to surrender. And it's a military word, meaning to maintain a place or a post and keep it from being overrun or taken by the enemy. And uh, we sing that song, Hold the Fort, for I'm coming. That's the same concept there. And then thirdly, the word maintain means to continue, not to suffer to cease. For example, we say people are maintaining a conversation, meaning they don't stop, there's no law, there's no gaps, there's a continual talking or a cadence there. And so it also means, number four, it means to keep up, to uphold, to support the expense of. For example, we would say maintaining uh, equipment, if you will. People talk about maintaining their vehicle. And there's time when you have to maintain your vehicle. Nothing major may be wrong, but you need, you need to go in, get the oil checked, check the oil, top off the fluids. You might need to check the brakes. You might need to rotate the tires. You might need to just do a small things to your vehicle. That would be in the maintenance category. It doesn't need an overhaul. It doesn't need to be rebuilt. You just need to maintain it. Keep it, keep it running at optimal performance and then to support with food or clothing or other conveniences such as maintaining a family or, or we hear that phrase maintaining a family maintaining a home means just keep things going keep things up and keep things paid up and then uh, you can get into more legal issues supporting by intellectual powers or by force of reason as in to maintain an argument. You may hear lawyers use that phrase in the courtroom, maintaining an argument. They keep throwing out facts. They keep throwing out different things to make their case. They're maintaining an argument. They're not losing ground. They're maintaining their argument. And so we've got multiple uses of this word maintain, but I think that the strongest and probably the most used word would be just to hold, to keep, not to lose, not to surrender, to preserve, or to keep in a particular state. Now, that's the English definition. I want to show you the Hebrew definition, which I think is amazing, uh, which is uh, really just builds on what I just told you. The Hebrew definition in, uh, in the Hebrew word is yalka, that is Y-A-K-A-C-H, and it means to decide, to reprove, to rebuke, 
to correct, to be right, to decide, to judge, to show to be right, or to be chastened. Now let me break that down for you for just a minute. I broke it down for you. So we see that, uh, that, that definition of, of, in the Hebrew of the word maintain means to decide or to reprove. Maybe you could write this down if you're taking notes. That speaks of a continual calibration. Just continually checking the calibration uh, to, to make sure that everything is working like it's supposed to. And then the word rebuke, that would speak of a continual criticism. Now this is what Job said he's doing to himself. All right, we're gonna get to that in just a second, but I want you to understand this word maintain is a serious word. It has a lot of weight to it. That's why this verse is so powerful. It means to, that, to rebuke. To rebuke means to one of continual criticism. The word correct, that is one of continual correction. Continual correction. Constantly, constantly tweaking, constantly fixing, constantly noticing anything that's out of sorts and making sure it's back like it ought to be. And then the definition to show to be right. This word speaks of a continual confirmation. To show to be right. People looking, people that are on the outside observing would be able to detect how that you're maintaining. And it uh, shows to be right, shows everything to be what it ought to be. And then the definition to judge or to decide, this word speaks of continual condemnation, meaning you're constantly looking for something that is wrong. You're constantly judging and assessing your life or the situation, as it were. And then the word to chasten, that word maintain in verse 15 in the Hebrew, one of the definitions and one of the applications of that Hebrew word is to chasten. That would speak of continual chastisement. Now, I've done my best to just lay out the meaning of that word. It's a heavy word. It's a weighty word, and it's a word that Job uses in this verse, but the way he used it and how he uses it has been a huge source of inspiration to me in my life, and I want it to speak to you tonight. We see the definition of maintain. Number two, write this down. We see the decision to maintain. We see the decision to maintain. I think we would all agree tonight maintenance is, an, is a good idea, but Job takes it to a completely different level. Notice three things about this decision to maintain by Job. Number one, it was a personal decision. Job said, I will maintain. You see that? I will maintain mine own ways. This is a personal decision. Decision. In other words, Job deliberately made a decision saying that what I'm about to say and the decision that I've made means that I don't require somebody else to constantly have to correct me. I'm going to do it to myself. He says, I would, I, I'm assuming full responsibility for my choices and for the ways that I take, the paths that I take, I'm assuming full responsibility for anything that goes wrong in my life, I will maintain, I will judge, I will reprove, I will rebuke, I will correct, I will show to be right, I will chasten my own ways. He says, in other words, I'm not gonna make it somebody else's responsibility to make sure I live for God. I'm going to take that responsibility upon myself. He would not rely on the observations of others to constantly correct his mistakes. He says, I'm not going to rely on the opinions of others to determine what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. He says, I'm not gonna rely on the love and concern of other people to keep me in line. I will maintain mine own ways. Now imagine what kind of Christian you and I could be. Imagine what kind of church we would be if every born again child of God took full responsibility for their spiritual condition and their relationship with Jesus Christ and didn't require somebody else to carry them and tote them and prop them up and prod them and push them and motivate them every single day, every single week. 
Imagine how close to God we would be if we continually chose and made the decision to maintain our way before the Lord, keeping our heart right, keeping our line of communication clear, and anything that got out of kilter in our life, we immediately took care of it ourselves. Imagine, imagine what kind of Christian you and I would be. He says, I'm not going to rely on others for my spiritual success. He made a decision to be completely 100% responsible for his walk with God. Now here's a man sitting in ashes that's lost everything he had. His wife stood beside him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? He looked at her and said, you talk as a foolish woman talketh. And then his three friends come, sit there and stared at him for seven days. And when they started talking, he eventually told them, just shut up. You're worthless. You're not helping me at all. I mean, it's about as bad as it gets. He is, he is emotionally at the end. He's spiritually at the end. He's financially at the end. He's emotionally, I mean, psychologically, everything in his life is at the bottom, and yet he makes this statement. I will maintain mine own ways before the Lord. It was a personal decision. Imagine, imagine how awesome it would be if you could get right with God before the invitation. Imagine if you could get right with God before church. Imagine if you had such a personal commitment to your spiritual life that you were able to get right with God as needed throughout the week and come to church already tuned up. And when the message is being preached, instead of you sitting there squirming saying, oh me, you could say, amen, that's exactly right. And instead of going to the altar and weeping because you've lived a life of a sorry Christian all week, you could come to the altar and weep and say, thank you, God, for showing me that yesterday. Thank you for showing me that two days ago. Thank you for showing that to me in my Bible reading. Thank you for pointing out those things in my life that need to be fixed. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that without the preacher having to tell me. Amen. I remember one time, I won't go into details, I don't have time. I remember one time I was sitting in church and boy, the Holy Spirit of God during a song service, this is when my, I was still in Bible college, I was sitting next to my wife and boy, the Holy Spirit of God, maybe I ought to tell what that was. That makes some of you real nervous. Sitting in the service and the Holy Spirit of God convicted me for being addicted to sports. Now this is when I was in Bible college. I, was in, I had a construction business and I was running the roads and I was running crews and I had Bible college Monday night, Tuesday night, church Wednesday night, soul winning, Thursday night, date night, Friday night. I mean, I was busy, but somehow or another I had time to read everything on the sports page. I could tell you every stat about every player and everything about them and who won and everything, which there ain't nothing wrong with keeping up with it, but it had become a weight in my life. So much so that I'm sitting in the service during the, during, the, uh, during the song service, and I leaned over to my wife, I leaned over to my wife, and I said, we're canceling the newspaper subscription tomorrow. I'm not reading the sports page no more. And I knew I had it bad when everybody at church would come up to me and want to know who won what game and what the numbers were. They knew I knew. And I didn't want to be known as the, as the preacher boy at church that everybody knew could tell them everything there was to know about sports. I didn't how I wanted to be known. So I leaned over to my wife, and I, I think I wrote it on a piece of paper, cancel the newspaper subscription, because we didn't have a TV, still don't. But I was reading that sports page. I read the comics and the sports page. Stay with me now. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with the comics. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with the sports page, but it was a weight in my life. And I leaned over, I wrote a piece, I wrote a piece of paper, I said cancel the newspaper subscription tomorrow. Sports has become a weight in my life and I'm fixing to deal with it, and I'm dealing with it. And I wrote it on a piece of paper, and I gave it to her. During the song service, man, the preacher got up, started preaching against sports. He got to preaching against idols and weights in your life and letting things come between you and God, and I was able to go, whoa, he thought I was probably being a hypocrite, 
But he didn't know I'd already got right with God. And I could say, whoa, that's good preaching. Instead of, oh, Lord, I wish he'd shut up so I could go to the altar. I went to him after church. I said, good message, ha, but I beat you to it. I got right with God before you even preached about it. Now, that's a good feeling when the Holy Spirit's talking to you without somebody else having to. Amen. So the decision was a personal decision. I will maintain mine own ways before the Lord. Not only was it a personal decision, it was a practical decision. He said, I will maintain. And here's my logic, and here was his logic. If it's worth having, it's worth maintaining. If it's worth having, whether it's a golf cart or whether it's a, a gun, I mean, you know how many people have guns and don't clean them and don't keep them old and they just get all rusted and they get useless? If it's worth having, it's worth taking care of. They don't take care of their vehicles. Go buy a nice vehicle and two years later, it looks like a piece of junk. They didn't keep it, they didn't keep it maintained. Their house not maintained, gutters falling off, doors falling off, windows falling out, sidings falling off. Can I get a witness right there? I see you women doing this to your husband. I see that. He's preaching to you, honey. Preaching to you. I told you to fix that door. Hey, if it's worth having, if it's worth having, it's worth maintaining. Well, here, we're not talking about temporal things. We're not talking about shotguns and motorcycles and, and boats and, and cars and houses. We're talking about a walk with God. Now, if it's worth having, it's worth maintaining. And, and it's a, so it was a practical decision. I mean, why start if you're not going to finish? Why have it if you're going to let it run down? Why say you're a Christian and then stop being one? So maintaining your walk with God, maintaining your spiritual condition just makes good sense. Not only was it a personal decision and practical decision, but thirdly, it was a private decision. He said, I will maintain mine always before the Lord. He wasn't making this decision to impress man. It was evident he was beyond the ability to impress anybody at this juncture. This man has lost everything he has. He's sitting in ashes with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. His wife's lost confidence in him. His friends have lost confidence in him. He's way past trying to impress people. But Job said, I will maintain my own ways because God is looking and because God is watching. I thought about what Solomon said in Proverbs 15:3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. I told you that verse was going to be in my message. We talked about this in pastor hour, didn't we? The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. That's, in your, that's when you're in your vehicle with nobody else in there. That's when you're in your bedroom with nobody else in there and the door's shut, lights are off. That's when you're by yourself. God help us. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So Job says, you know what? I will maintain my own ways before the Lord. I'm gonna make sure that I critique and criticize and judge and reprove and rebuke myself and set everything in order myself because God is watching. He wasn't trying to put on a show. He just wanted to be right with God. It was important to him that in spite of all of his problems, his relationship with God didn't suffer. And let me say this, if your relationship with God is not what it ought to be, you can mark this down, it is not God's fault. It's not God's fault if your relationship with him used to, be, used to be sweet, used to be right. If he used to talk to you, if you used to hear his voice, if you used to feel his presence in your life, God hasn't changed. The problem is not on God's end. Somewhere along the way, you and I fail to maintain our own way 
before the Lord. And the check engine light came on. And you just put a piece of electrical tape over it so you wouldn't have to see it. Now, I know nobody in here has ever done that. But I've read about people doing that. And they think that if they're not seeing it, that it's okay. If it's not just glaring at them, if it's not just right there in front of them, that it's going to fix itself. Let me tell you something. I don't know of anything that fixes itself. But one thing I promise you won't fix itself, and that is mine and your relationship with God. Requires maintenance. Requires a little fine-tuning. And listen to me. If you'll just maintain it every day, you won't have any trouble. But if you wait till you're going down the road and the transmission drops out before you call the preacher or before you pray, it might be you need a major overhaul. That's one of the most discouraging things to me as a pastor because I'm in a position where I want to help people. A lot of people wait till the house is burnt completely down before they call the fire department. I mean, when that check engine light comes on, when that, when that sensor comes on and tells you to change the oil at 3,000 miles or 4,000 miles or 5,000 miles and you just keep driving it and you don't put oil in it and you lock that engine down, you can call Jiffy Lube all you want to and oil change ain't going to fix it. Is everybody still with me? If you maintain, if we'll maintain our ways before the Lord, we can operate at optimum performance without having to go to a whole lot of stress. Amen. Just throughout the day, the Holy Spirit of God say, what are you doing? He said, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My papa used to go, eh? That's what he'd say, eh? That's South Georgia for you. Better not do that. Start toward, start toward something, start to do something. Go up to change the channel on TV. Go, eh? That means put your hand back and walk away. Don't do it. Eh, eh. Hey, the Holy Spirit does that to me all the time. I don't know what he does to you, but that's what he does to me. He goes, eh, 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 don't do that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Lord, you're right. I won't, I won't say what I was thinking. I'll just let that go. Eh. <laughs> mm. You get that email or you see that Facebook post and you, boy, you fire that typewriter up. Woo, and you go to town typing. Man, it feels so good flying off the end of your fingers and before you can hit send or upload or post, the Holy Ghost goes, eh, and you go, you know what? I might better just delete all that. Get that wide out. Redact about three-fourths of that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You get that text message and your blood pressure starts to go like this. Best thing you do, take that phone, lay it down, and go pray for a little while. Yes, <laughs> I think as Benjamin Franklin says, if you're angry, count to 10 before you say anything. And if you're very angry, count to 100. <laughs> and if you can't count that high, just count to 10, 10 times. Hey, it was a private decision. He wasn't trying to impress people. He just wanted to be right with God. Number three, write this down. We see the definition, we see the decision, but we see the determination to maintain. If Job had just said, if verse 15 had started in the middle of that verse with the word I, this would be a really good verse. I will maintain my own ways before the Lord. Boy, that's good. That's wonderful. We could preach on that for a month. But that's only the second half of the verse. Job, when he made this statement, prefaced it with a statement that takes real, real, real Christianity to say. Look at what he says. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. My goodness. What a statement. I remember the first time I preached this verse. I didn't preach a whole message on it. Like I said earlier, I've never preached a whole message just on this verse, but I've used this verse before at the end of another message. 
And I remember when I read it and studied it and preached it the first time, boy, it was, it was, it was easy preaching. Little did I know that within the next two, three weeks of my life with that verse that I had so eloquently preached be put to the test in my life. Before the service, my wife and I were in my office and I said, "Just I said, Grace, you've got a better memory than I do because I just have the ability if something really bad happens to me at some point, I just block it out. I just don't think about it no more. I just forget it. And I just know something bad happened, but I don't remember all the details. Now, women, they remember everything. Amen. Everything. They can tell you what color dress they had on when they said it, the look on their face, where they were standing in the church. Guys are just like, man, he said something stupid the other day. I don't even remember what it was. And the women's like, oh, no, I'll tell you exactly what she said. <laughs> But seriously, I preached this at our church, and man, I'm telling you what, the devil said, let's see if you really believe that, boy. And one thing after the other, I mean, if it can happen, it happened. I remember right after this, right after I preached this message on, though he slay me, I remember the deacons at the church got together and got a secret meeting behind my back. And one of them calls me and says, we need to talk to you about something. I said, is there a problem? Oh, no, 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 there's no problem. Just need to talk to you about something. And I get down there and they had booby trapped me, man, I'm telling you. They had, they had cut a hole out in the floor. They was ready to drop me into the abyss. Caught me off guard, passing out letters and trying to get everybody to turn against me. And I'm sitting at my desk going, what in the world? world and that was just that's the good part it went downhill from there people in the church calling I'm leaving the church why well I'm just done with it down there why what's wrong I'm just done with it well we need to talk whatever's bothering you I ain't talking I ain't coming up there I'm done with you and I mean, and then another guy calls me and says, I can't take no more of your preaching. I can't take no more of your attitude. You're going to be working in a factory one of these days if you don't get your attitude right. And I mean, just dress me up one side and down the other. I remember I had my phone on speakerphone, and I was walking around in the horse barn, and my wife's looking at me going, don't, don't say nothing, don't say nothing. I said, I ain't going to say nothing, but I didn't know what to say. That's pretty strong. And it was a preacher in the church. I'm done with you and your attitude and your preaching and I can't take it no more and the church is sick of it. And if you don't get right with God, you're going to be working in a factory one day. And I thought, wow. I know I preach hard sometimes, but I didn't know it was that bad. Two days later, he called and apologized. I'm sorry. I said, you know what? I forgive you. It never happened. I tell you what, why don't you preach Wednesday night? And I let the sucker preach. And sat right behind him and amen him the whole time, snake in the grass. And I mean just one thing after the other, one thing after the other, secret meetings and people calling and acting up. And man, the kind of stuff that just tears up your insides. During that time, we had not told the church, we hadn't even told our children that my wife was expecting. And this was before Zane was born. She was expecting and we didn't tell anybody. We thought we'd wait. And good thing we did. But right after all this happened, I mean like the next week, she had a miscarriage. She was so stressed out. That's pretty much probably what caused it. She had a miscarriage and went back for a visit and the doctor said, something's not right. Said your numbers are supposed to be going down, but they're going up and there's been a miscarriage and we don't know what's wrong. And Come back the next week. We went back the next week. Numbers were still going up. Something's not right. We, did the numbers show that there's another baby, but I can't see one. Did all kinds of tests and sonograms and all kinds of stuff. Couldn't find another baby. Something's not right. We said, well, we're going out of town Friday, going down to South Georgia. We lived in Greenville. Going down to South Georgia, he said, well, if you get to hurting real bad, you better go to the hospital. So Friday afternoon, we jumped in the vehicle, all of us, and we drove from Greenville Drove down through Atlanta, got to Atlanta. It was rush hour. If you've never been through Atlanta at rush hour, it's just like here. It was raining. 
I mean, it was just a mess, and it was already a long way, but that just made it take forever. And we drove and drove and drove and drove and fought the rain and fought the weather and fought the vehicles and finally got to South Georgia to my aunt's house about 11 o'clock at night. Man, I was exhausted. Just give out. We were stressed out. We was give out. We still didn't tell the church, still didn't tell our children what had happened about losing the baby. And we're, we're, we're sitting in the living room that Friday night talking and just everybody's just sitting around kind of catching up. And I noticed my wife slipped out, went out, and she texted me. She says, I'm hurting. And I went back and found her in the back room down on the floor. She was white as a sheet. She said, Stacy, I am dying. I am, I am dying. And I said, well, we got to do something. So I, I went in and told my, my aunt's husband, I said, we got to take her to the hospital. He said, well, there ain't much of a hospital in this town. He said, it ain't much bigger than a vet. I said, well, let's take her. We picked her up, carried her, put her in the car, went to the hospital. She's screaming. She's crying. I told the doctors, I said, she had a miscarriage, but her count's going up. Doctors said she may have another one, but we can't find one. I said, it, whatever it is, it's bad, and you need to do something now. And they put her in a back room, left her for an hour or two. I was about ready to shoot somebody. For they finally said, we're going to take her to Albany. We're going to take her to Phoebe Putney Hospital at, the, at Albany. And so we loaded her up on the ambulance and took, took about 45 minutes away to Albany. By now, it's 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm give out. I mean, I am just absolutely exhausted. I'm stressed out. She's crying. She's hurting. And we got to the hospital. They rushed her in. I told the doctors what had happened about the miscarriage. And I remember the doctor rushed her in. He said, Mr. Shiflett, you just go wait in the waiting room, and uh, we'll go in and see what we can do. And we'll let you know as soon as we know something. Well, I went to the waiting room. It's empty, obviously. It's 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Not a soul in there. Big old waiting room. And I remember, I remember getting out on my knees. And I don't know if anybody in here has ever been so tired and so anxious and so stressed and so worried that you can't pray. All you can do is groan. Anybody ever done had that happen? I've done. Okay. Good, I feel better. I thought it was just me. I lay down on the floor of that waiting room and I just cried and I just cried and said, oh God, please don't let nothing happen to her. Please help her. Please help her. And there wasn't a soul in there but me. I was in there probably for an hour and a half, two hours by myself. It was, they had most of the lights turned off. It was dark. I couldn't sleep because I was worried about her. Doctor came in probably five, six o'clock in the morning, came in. And he brought some color photographs in there. And he said, Mr. Schiff, let me tell you what happened. He said, your wife had the twins. And one passed away uh, a week or so ago, like you said. And there was another one. It was a tubal pregnancy. And it ruptured. And Mr. Schiff, I'm going to just show you here that she's, she's going to be okay, we think. But she lost a lot of blood. She nearly, she nearly died. And... He said, uh, let me go back and see about her. And he walked out and left me there looking at those pictures in that waiting room. And the devil. You know I hate the devil. If you see the devil tomorrow, would you do me a favor? Would you kick him from me? The devil crawled upon my shoulder. That's what happens when you're tired. When you're tired. And the devil just jumped upon my shoulder and said, here you are trying to live for God and everybody in the church is turning against you. Your wife's about to die. You just lost twins. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Five hours, six hours from home. You're down here on a Saturday. You're supposed to be going back home this afternoon and preach at your church tomorrow and that's obviously not going to happen. What are you going to do? And I remember... I remember this verse. I remember this verse. The Holy Ghost brought this verse to my mind as clear as anything. And I dropped down to my knees and buried my face in that chair. And I said, Devil, it's going to take more than this to get me to quit on God. Though he slay me, Yet will I trust in him. And I remember, I remember laying there and crying, saying, God, I don't know what you're doing, and I don't know why you're doing it. 
but you've been too good to me for me to let this turn my heart from serving you. And I was sitting there for a while and the doctor said, you can come on back. About that time, my aunt showed up with the kids. They still had no idea what was happening. And I walked in that hospital room, my wife laying there just as pale as a sheet. And I looked at her and we just started crying and the kids were standing there and they didn't know what was going on. And I had to set my youngins down and tell them that mom and daddy was expecting twins. Both of them is dead. That's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And my, my, my wife's sister came and got our kids and took them back home. And me and my wife sat in an RV for about four days while she healed. And we just prayed and we just begged God, please don't let us get bitter. Don't let us get bitter over this. Because we both still believe to this day that what was happening in the church is what caused it. And we couldn't even tell anybody. We couldn't even tell anybody what happened. We just had to just suppress it. And the whole time, Brother Hall, all this is going on in my heart and in my mind. And the devil's trying to get me to get in the flesh, trying to get me to lose my testimony, trying to get me to get up in this pulpit and tell everybody in the whole church what everybody said and everybody did, which would have been wrong. Blaming people. And I remember that day, this verse became such a part of my life. And every time I ever read this verse or hear a reference to it, I remember that morning, early that morning in that waiting room, when this verse became a true test of my devotion and dedication and commitment to God. And I said to, I said to God that day, Lord, if you'll help me, I want to be right with you. I don't care what anybody else does and Lord I don't even care what you do you do whatever it is you want to do but I know what I'm going to do I'm going to maintain my own ways before the Lord I'm telling you right now Job wasn't in it for the comfort he was committed to God not because of what he could get out of God but because of who God is Look at the next verse, I'm finished. Verse 16, he also shall be my salvation. A hypocrite shall not come before him. I thought about that verse, Brother Caleb, when the kids was over here singing that little song tonight. I don't want to be no hypocrite. I thought about my message tonight right here in the text. For a hypocrite shall not come before him. In Job's mind, stay with me, I'm done. In Job's mind, a person that only serves God for what they can get out of it is a hypocrite. In Job's mind, a person that only lives right because somebody else is telling them to is a hypocrite. In Job's mind, a person that doesn't love God enough to trust him in bad times is a hypocrite. In Job's mind, a person that was a hypocrite had no chance of coming before God. And Job said, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to serve you when the money's coming in and when my health is good and when my crops are coming in. I don't want to serve you when my wife's for me and my friends are for me and then turn my back on you when everything falls apart. That's why he looked at his wife when she tried to get him to curse God and he said I will not he did not sin with his lips he said I will bless the name of the Lord Amen. and Job made this decision and had this kind of commitment he didn't have a Bible he didn't have a church he didn't have a pastor he didn't have brothers or sisters in the Lord and he did not have the Holy Spirit living within him I wonder tonight heads are bowed eyes are closed are you willing tonight to say with Job, I will maintain 